Okay, right, so what I was saying is I'm going to get us started um, because we've got quite a lot to show today, as you can see from this slide, 10 teams who want to demo okay, something. Let's, let's, let's. Excuse me? Um, so yeah, but before we get started with the demos, I did want to um, welcome, we have a couple of new team members. Esteban Sanchez has joined the Scanbit team. And Yeli Zaveta Koklova has joined the Spitfire team. So um, welcome to our new developers. And I'm also going to skip, we're going to skip Jakob's usual slides on the mm -hmm. release timeline. And that's partly because we have very limited time today, but also because um, as some of you may have heard, um, the capacity planning team is um, recommending that the product council consider a one month extension to the honeysuckle release. Um, so we, um, we still need, uh, you know, the PC consideration and approval on that. Um, but when we get um, their response, we will certainly share the new dates with the community. Um, so the dates are, you know, a little bit up in the air at the moment. Exactly. So that's really all I'm going to say by way of introduction. And um, I'd like to just start the demos now. Uh, it looks like we've got Thunderjet here at the top of the list uh, with Dennis. Are you there, Dennis? Sounds good. Yeah, uh, good. quick start. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, maybe this works out uh, for the best in the end. We have obviously been working on a ton of functionality, and this is a big chunk of work that we're focusing on in this particular sprint demo. Um, so we did have a list of things. A few of those things are we're having issues with in terms of bugs. Um, so we've cut down our list of demo today. It's just going to be Alexi rather than three of us showing things. But it is kind of appropriate in that uh, Alexi is going to demonstrate some functionality that really is focused around invoicing and finance. Uh, so managing finances in the finance app and processing invoices. Um, the feature is, I think it's called a shared allocation, but really focuses on expense classes. Uh, and a lot of work has gone into this in the last number of sprints. Also, the team's been working on a lot of, obviously, bug fixes and hot fixes and doing some incredible work. So I just wanted to hats off uh, to Thunderjet for all the hard work that they've done. And I'll pass things on. And Alexi's going to go through um, the expense class functionality and talk a little bit about invoices as well. Some, some new things that happen with invoices. And hopefully okay. you're ready to go. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Dennis, for introduction. Oops. I hope you see my screen. Yep, yep. we do. Okay. Uh, so here we have a uh, couple stories. Uh, I'll start start with expense classes. Uh, if you remember, we have uh, implemented in finances such uh, things as expense class. We have to predefined, and we can create a new one. Uh, so after that, we can go to finance app and. Uh, I created several funds. Let's check uh, demo fund. Here we have current budget. Uh, and uh, if we go here and edit, we have uh, like a section with expense classes. We can assign expense classes to that budget. So let's add a, uh, a new expense class. Here we can save the budget. Um, so for now, if we go to budget details, it, it contains uh, statistics uh, uh, by expense classes. Uh, so if we go, uh, if we use that class, it will be like um, mentioned here. So let, let's use um, expense class uh, in orders. Uh, I've created a demo order and the demo order line. Uh, 
so when we have price to distribute, we can distribute it among uh, our demo funds. If fund has expense class, it will be predefined. So, but if it uh, contains several, it will be free selection, but field is required. So let's uh, distribute 50-50 between two funds. Second fund, we uh, were not assigning any classes. So it's uh, without that field. Uh, let's save our push order line and uh, we can open that order. Uh, so I think we uh, now can go to invoice. I've prepared one. Uh, so in case we add the invoice line based on our push order line, it will uh, be added. Uh, we'll not make any adjustment. It will use uh, fund distribution from push order line. So we can approve our invoice and uh, actually pay it. So appropriate transactions are created. After that, we can go to the uh, our fund and uh, budget. And here we have our statistic. Since only half uh, of push third line cost uh, was distributed uh, to demo fund one, it's uh, like mirrored here. So yeah, here's our expense classes thing. Uh, Regarding the second one feature, uh, it's an invoice. So in case, in case we uh, create new invoice and uh, somehow we, we will select uh, the same, um, not the same, uh, but push the line that already paid so, uh, as a, uh, have done before, just now. So we'll sh see some useful message. Um, here we have uh, pushed to the line that already paid since I've created invoice and paid it. So when user uh, will try to add the same push to the line, he will see uh, such message. It's small, but pretty useful. Here we have also a sign that it's paid uh, in case he will add uh, several preserved lines. Uh, basically, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Alexi. Thanks, Dennis. Yes. So next up we have Firebird and Steph's gonna do an intro. Hi there. Oh, I mean, hang on one second. Okay, I heard myself echoing. Let's hope this helps. Um, so the last time Firebird demoed, we were able to show you a little bit of moving holdings and items in inventory. Um, we were able to show you moving items between holdings within one instance. But we are now able to show you um, more functionality along those lines. And I wanted to thank um, Charlotte and the working group for putting together such straightforward and clear requirements so that Firebird and I knew exactly what we were doing. So with that, I will hand it off to Nikita. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie, and uh, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, I hope you see it. Yes. So, yeah. Um, this time uh, I'd like to show, as Stephanie mentioned, a new action, move holdings and items to another instance. Uh, so, yeah, let's press this action. And here we see uh, instances look up to select uh, 
uh, instance to move items uh, or from. Uh, Yeah, and uh, um, after selecting instances, we see two split screens. On the left side, uh, instance from, and uh, on the right side, instance to. And uh, it actually um, displays uh, the same information that uh, uh, is displayed on uh, instance details uh, we have on three planes layout. And uh, there are actions here um, added for all instances and uh, view source only for uh, instances with uh, source mark. mark. And uh, let's move, um, for example, holdings to another instance. And yeah, it was successfully moved. And uh, the same functionality that uh, we demonstrated before with items uh, when we move um, items between holdings. Additionally, we can move um, items and holdings uh, vice versa uh, from uh, instance we selected to uh, instance that uh, was a source. And uh, actually, that's it. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. It's great progress. Okay, so um, Scanbit, this is exciting. Anne Marie, you wanted to give an intro? Sure. So um, we're delighted to have our first demo today by the new development team that's working on MarkCat. Um, at Cult is still working on it, but Scanbit is working on it now as well. Um, they're working on some general cleanup of the MarkCat app, as well as starting development for Mark Authority Records support. So Estito is going to give the first demo. And with that, Estito. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm going to share the screen. Uh, here and uh, now uh, I'm I'm going to speak about our work. We have been working in Marcat, a module designed to facilitate the management of Mark, Mark records, including the creation, editing, viewing, and deletion, and also including the use of authority control records. Uh, now, now I'm going to show you some slides with the screenshot of folio where you can see the change made, and I'm also going to show you the buttons and some searches in Folio. Uh, now I'm going to start with, with this change that we made in the searching. Uh, we, we create a, a buttons to separate the search by bibliographic and authority. As you can see here, we, the, you can see the two buttons, and uh, here I have put the two screens uh, to see the difference. Uh, this is before and this is now. Uh, before we have no buttons and now we have created uh, these buttons because uh, the searching index are different for, bibliogra for bibliographic and authority, so it's necessary to create a group of buttons before the, the filter of searching, like in inventory. According to button selection, the index and facets change. Uh, if we show in folio, uh, here we have a bibliographic and we have uh, the index to select. And if we select authority, we have different index to select. Did you, were you showing live also? Because right now we're just seeing the PowerPoint. I return to the PowerPoint. Okay. 
And here we have uh, another uh, chain that we have made is uh, is uh, related with the look and feel, the design of folio. We put save and cancel buttons in the cataloging worksheet, like in inventory. With this change, Marcat should have the same look, look and feel than other folio apps. Uh, here in the in this, I, I can show. Are you showing my screen? Yes, now. We're just seeing if the PowerPoint. We, yes? We're just seeing the PowerPoint, not, not anything live that you might be doing. And you can say you, all, you only see the PowerPoint? Yes, correct. I, I don't know what is happening. Well, if you. If we do a search and we edit the record to save change, uh, uh, before uh, we make in the bibliographic record and we have to edit a screen. And to save the change, we have to click on the edit record. And now, with this change, we have a cancel and a button to save and close the change, like in inventory. Uh, And I, and I, if I share the, this, this screen, you only see the PowerPoint. Now and you are seeing. Uh, yeah, we're just seeing that PowerPoint, but that's okay. I think if you just go through your slides and if everybody knows, um, if you go to Folio Snapshot or Folio Snapshot Load, okay. um, what, what you're okay. seeing the PowerPoint is, is live there as well. Okay, sorry. So uh, we, uh, we put uh, save and cancel buttons like in inventory. And now uh, we are working, working to separate uh, the search results. Uh, we have done two buttons to separate the search and now the, the results uh, uh, have to be, have to appear separately also. Also, now if we say, if we search by bibliographic, the result, well, sorry, yes, uh, we, we, now we are working to search uh, that, sorry, I mean, to separate, we want to separate search result. If we search by bibliographic, the, the result page will show bibliographic, and if we search by authority, the result page will show as authority records. Now, as you can see in this in this slide, we we say uh, bibliographic records and authority records in the same page result. This is an authority record, and this is an uh, this is our uh, those are bibliograph uh, bibliographic records. And uh, with with this change, uh, search bibliographic retrieves bibliographic records, like in this slide, and if we search by authority, uh, we retrieve authority records, like in this slide, and in this that we can say the more files of the record. So that is, that was all what we, go, we want to show you. Uh, thanks for attending our demo. All right, thanks, SD2. And so um, we we were a little concerned, and uh, and you can hear uh, SD2's English is a uh, is she's concerned sometimes. So we wanted to make sure we had the slides. Um, but like I said, this is live as well. If you if you want to go take a look at it in um, Folio Snapshot or Folio Snapshot Load. Um, we're still working on some of the, or sorry, ScanBit is still working on some of the authority related stuff, but the, some of the um, screen changes that she was showing in the earlier slides are live. Great. Well, these slides look amazing and I'm sure we'll be checking it out in Snapshot. Thank you, Estee too. Thank you. Okay, so actually, Anne-Marie, you're up next with FolyJet. 
Yes, and so um, it has been a crazy four sprints for Folajet. Um, we've done a ton of bug fixes and hot fixes. We've worked down our accessibility tech debt some, um, and we kind of picked out some highlights to show today. So Maria is going to show a new settings that we have for being able to protect mark fields from being overlaid when you're updating a mark record through import. The UI is ready, but not the back end yet. Um, then Igor is going to show repeatable fields, which are, uh, which ha you have different actions that you can take in the field mapping profiles when you're working with repeatable fields and the mapping for those. Um, and then Yvonne is going to show how you can remove data from a field using the, the field mapping profiles now instead of just replacing the data in a field. So Maria. Yes, hello everyone. Let me share my screen. Do you see it? Yes, thank you. Oh. Okay, so as Emma already mentioned, I'm going to demo a new mark for protection settings page. And these uh, settings were implemented to protect a specific mark field from updating. Let's navigate to this page. And here we can see um, really two default fields set by the system. So a user can't change or delete those fields somehow, but we can add a new one field, for example, and save it. And here it is. It's already uh, sorted by the field column. And also a user can uh, edit this field or delete it. And once I click on this button, I have a default confirmation message and it asks me, uh, I'm sure I want this field to be deleted. And I say yes. And success, there is no edit aid field in this table and uh, we continue working on this page but for today that's all i'd like to show and if you have any questions don't hesitate to contact me thank you all right quick and easy one there maria <laughs> yeah and igor yes hello everyone let me share my screen Yes, uh, I hope yeah. you see it now. Yes, yeah. okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> just some issues with my computer and sharing the Zoom screen. Uh, so for today's demo, I'm gonna show you uh, the four different actions which you can apply if, uh, when you work with uh, mapping profiles, repeatable fields. And I have already set up uh, uh, different actions and different mapping profiles. So as you can see, the first one is add, no add notes. And I will show you this on, uh, update and holdings notes, for example. So as you can see for this profile, we, I have already created uh, four different nodes, which should be added to some mark field. And uh, also for uh, find and remove, I also create uh, these nodes, uh, uh, this uh, different nodes which should be removed and action which will be applied is find and remove. Also for delete existing and add new nodes, uh, we have here action delete all existing and add this, and we will delete uh, all existing nodes and add this new node here. And for delete all nodes, 
as you already expected, we will have just, uh, we'll, uh, have just delete all existing values for this node. So also I've already set up uh, appropriate action profiles for these four actions and uh, match profile and uh, we will match in here with electronic access URI. So, and for incoming records is field uh, 8556 uh, five, and uh, in uh, indicator four, indicator two and subfield U. So also here is exists already uh, these four different job profiles and let's just try to do the data import and see how it works. So I've already uh, created this mark, uh, so this mark field. So I will just edit uh, for the first time and apply this add node to existing profile. And then I run job. Uh, so let's just wait a little bit when it's, yes, it's applied. Then uh, I'm going to inventory and uh, here we should find, oh, oops. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, and now we are finding these options and view the holdings. And here we can see this uh, updating holding nodes. This all four nodes are applied for this record. So the next scene, uh, we are going to the data import one more time and choose the same record. And for this time, uh, I will apply this find and remove actions, running it, and I suppose it's already applied. I'm going to inventory, find one more time for the same share ID, and check in the holdings. And here we can see that now we have only three nodes and the fourth was deleted. So let's just try one more action. So I'll import one more time this record. And in this time I will apply uh, delete existing and add new one node, run it. So let's wait a little. Yes, I suppose it's already applied. Then one more time go into inventory, search for current record and check the holdings. And now we can see that all uh, nodes was deleted and one new was added here. And the last action which we can apply for the current, for updating current records, it's delete all existence. So I one more time upload this file and uh, choose delete all the nodes here run it. Yes, go into the inventory, search for current records, the holdings, and now you can see that all holding nodes were deleted. And I suppose that's it for current story. And also one more thing I want to mention that uh, during our last development, uh, we are also uh, updating the behavior of four span for mapping profiles uh, screen. And now it uh, shows up uh, in the full screen mode. So for action profiles, it remains the same, but for mapping profiles, for more convenient, we are making it on the full screen view. So I suppose that's it from my side. Thank you. If you have any question, just ask me.
Yay, Igor, that looked great. And also a shout out to Kate Senchenko. Um, he, Igor was using the match on the URI in the E uh, electronic access field of the holdings record. And so there's been a lot of bugs around that and Kate's been working really hard to get rid of those. Yeah, so it's here. <laughs> All right, and last is Yvonne. Yeah, hello everyone. Let me share my screen. So, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Cool. Uh, so, for today's demo, let me show you two cool uh, new features, which was implemented during uh, science last period. So, as Anne Marie mentioned before, one of them uh, related to new way how we can remove existing value from uh, some of the field from the mapping profile settings and um, during uh, showing uh, this case I'll try to show you second feature uh, which related to um, new match options for item holding and instances entities as well so uh, first of all, let's navigate to inventory and uh, search uh, for the uh, existing uh, instance uh, which contain an item. Yeah, uh, let's look in through this item and uh, I want to pay your attention that this item have uh, value uh, for the few fields, but uh, let's look in through um, temporary long time field and uh, location temporary field. Uh, so also uh, mm -hmm. yeah uh, uh, for this purpose we have a job profile in our uh, data import settings. Let's look in uh, through it. So purpose of this job file actually it's uh, to remove uh, values, uh, actually uh, two fields uh, which I mentioned uh, before, uh, uh, for existing records which match, uh, let's see it. So we match incoming mark uh, bibliographic records with existing item records. And for incoming records, we're looking through the 901 field with subfield A value. And um, for existing item, this is a new implemented feature. Uh, currently, we can match by UUID. As I mentioned before, this feature implemented uh, for item uh, holding and instance entities as well. Uh, but let's stay with item. So, um, this job profile for much at existing records has an action which should update existing item with following mapping profile. And this mapping profile includes our new way how we can to remove existing value. It's this remove value. Uh, I want to pay your attention uh, to syntax. So this value has uh, three hash symbols uh, on the start of the value and in the end, and just like the today option for date picker fields. So uh, with this job, job profile, we uh, will try to remove a temporary long type field and a location temporary field from existing item. Uh, for this purpose, uh, we will upload our demo mark field, uh, which actually include uh, UUID of uh, those item in uh, mention field 901 and so field A. So uh, for this uploading file, we will use our job profile, run it. Wait a little bit, yeah, complete. So let's navigate to inventory. Uh, yeah, looking for the same item. 
and here we are temporary long time field and location temporary field are empty so actually i think that's it from my side if you have any question just ask it i'll try to answer it thank you thank you ivan um great uh, so with that, we will move on to um, Concord and Magda will do an intro. Hello everyone. Um, in the last four sprints, uh, we concentrated on expanding functionality of data export mapping profile. At the end of Q2, we supported custom transformations for uh, 12 fields, holdings and uh, items. Now we, we will support uh, more than 60 fields from instance holdings and items records. Since the list is growing, we needed to revisit look and feel of the mapping profile to accommodate uh, searching and filtering uh, functionality to make uh, finding a specific field easy. In today demo, Kruti Vupala will present the backend work. Yevgeny uh, Malcev will walk us through the UI changes. And we finish the demo with uh, Igor Gorchakov talking about the shared uh, library that we have created for uh, generating records on the fly. Uh, the team is currently working on integrating backend and front end uh, functionality. Uh, so this part will be presented during our future demos. Thank you. Kruti, are you ready? Yes. Uh, hello, all. Let me share my screen. So, just as a refresher, uh, uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, just as a refresher of uh, what Magna mentioned, this is what we had in our Goldenrod release. So to export any records, um, we supported the default fields and uh, to provide the custom transformations. Uh, these were the fixed set of fields that we were supporting. So during the past sprints, uh, we worked on creating, um, uh, generating all these records on the fly. So including the fields from instances, holdings and items. Um, like for example, in the previous demo, we've seen the holding note types and uh, item note types. So uh, for example, if we wanted to uh, export the specific item note type, which is of action note into a different field. And uh, uh, if it's a staff only field, if you want to move it to a different field. So to, to support uh, all types of fields, um, this uh, API will be helpful. And we're still in the, in the process of integrating with the UI. So that's the reason you're just seeing uh, uh, the back end of it for now. Um, the other part is all these uh, uh, fields are generated on the fly. So if there are uh, any new identifiers added or any other new reference data added, uh, it will be included immediately in, uh, uh, in the fields. And uh, right now, based on the number of reference uh, data that is present in the reference environments, uh, the total number of fields that we support is close to 200. Um, and uh, uh, we've designed in such a way that it will also easily support the translation of all of these fields uh, when it is shown on the uh, when it is shown on the UI. So that's all I have. Thank you, Kriti. Yevgeny. Yeah, uh, I will share on my screen. Uh, do you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so hi everyone. I would like to share with you the information about updates in the data export model. Here is a new mapping profile form. We added a new way to select transformations. So let's try it. Here is a new model and users uh, can use search to find transformations or filter them by record types. 
users need to fill the transformation field, for example, with value, with value or left is as empty and check checkboxes to select the items. Even if user selected items and used filters to search for another one, uh, and our previous selection is not displayed anymore, users shouldn't, um, shouldn't worry about it. We remember their choice and display a special message about the previous selection. Also, there is a useful stuff to select all displayed uh, transformations and unselect them. Also, uh, filters can be reset by using a special button. Okay, let's save selected transformations. Here is a callout and a list of selected transformations. Let's save this mapping profile. As you can see, it was added to the list. Let's go to the created mapping profile. As you can see, the action menu was added and now we support uh, deleting of job and mapping profiles and editing on of only mapping profiles. Let's start from deleting. Users have to confirm their decisions. Uh, let's press on delete button. The special callout is displayed and uh, the, the mapping profile is removed from the list. If, for example, the transformation can be removed because of network issue, uh, the special error cloud will display it. Also, it should be mentioned that the default, the default mapping profiles and mapping profiles that are used in job profiles can't be removed and delete options will be disabled. I showed you how to uh, remove mapping profiles and you can play with job profiles on our environments and keep in mind we can't delete the, the default job profile and the job profiles that I use it in job executions. As I mentioned before we added editing of mapping profiles uh, for sorry this is default profile let's go to the custom. So uh, it should be mentioned now we support editing of summary section, but the transformation section with it will be added soon. And keep in mind, you can't uh, edit the default profiles. So this is all for today, but the development is in progress and we will show you even more cool features the next time. Thank you, Evgeny. This was great. Thank you. Is there one more for um, Concord, Igor? Yes, Igor will uh, be here shortly. Yeah, just a second. I'm sharing. So, uh, hello. Uh, this is Igor, and I'm, I, I want to show uh, the shared library we created as a part of uh, work on data export. Uh, the library is called Generate Mark Utils, and the basic idea of this library is just is to generate uh, bibliographic records based on the input data using mapping rules. So at the first at the first releases, uh, this code was used in the repository of data export. And uh, at the Q3, we decided to move this code out of uh, data export into, into the separate repository. So now uh, we use this library in data export uh, with the purpose to generate mark records from uh, inventory instances, colonies, and items. And uh, here is a slide uh that shows how the library works uh under the hood uh the library just consumes two things uh this is mapping rules 
uh, and uh, this is a JSON object that can uh, that can be any inventory record uh, that play uh, a source of uh, data. This can be inventory holding instance or item. So the processor applies given rules to the uh, given object. And uh, as a result, as an outcome, we get bibliographic records. So uh, the produced records can be in Mark or XML or JSON format. So this is, this is how it works in general. And uh, at this moment, data export is the only one place uh, where the library is used. And uh, in future, it will be used in multiple folio modules. So I'm done. Nothing else from me. Thanks for attention. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Concord. Uh, Spitfire is up next with Kalila starting off. Hey, everybody. Um, the uh, Spitfire team ha has done a uh, great job over the last, as always, um, but uh, over the last three sprints, they've had to, um, they were involved in quite a few different features and modules. Um, Vlad's gonna show um, some of the work they've done to, uh, uh, to um, enhance the, the Notes Helper app, and also some of the work they've done to add um, the, departments to the users uh, to the user record but the team has done some other things uh, they they added the preferred uh, name which was demo I think the previous sprint uh, review uh, but they now have um, updated it so that you can actually search by pref uh, uh, preferred name is returned in the search the user search uh, they made some updates to uh, custom fields and also they've done quite a bit of work um, um, especially Pablo and Natalia on the user import, mod user import too. So uh, great job by the team. And now I'm going to uh, pass it pass it on to uh, Vlad to uh, demo the notes helper wrap updates and the department updates that the team's made. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Halila. Uh, can I will share my screen. Um, just a second. And do you see it? Yeah. Maybe yes. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, let's start with the departments. Uh, in the user settings, uh, we see the new top uh, department, and uh, <clears throat> this page uh, presented by controller to workup component. Here we can create, edit, and uh, delete uh, departments. Let's create the new one. Uh, name and code fields are required. Uh, and uh, it must be uh, unique values. Otherwise, we will get uh, the validation error. So let's check it. And for example, uh, but we will create uh, the new one. So it is successfully created. Also, we can delete it. If we click on uh, basket button and uh, delete button in model menu, we will see the notification message that uh, department was successfully deleted. Uh, after creating several departments, uh, we can add them to the user record. So uh, let's go to the summon user. Uh, for example, uh, in extended information, we will see the uh, department name uh, field. Uh, let's edit it. Uh, here we can see the select component. Uh, let's add some departments, for example. Uh, yep, uh, and save it. And uh, departments, uh, if we have several departments, uh, they uh, will be uh, separated by the commas. If uh, any departments uh, uh, isn't uh, edited to the uh, user record, we will see the dash uh, value. So the next part of our demo is uh, notes updates. Uh, first of all, uh, we added uh, all notes functionality to the uh, request details page. Uh, here we can create note, uh, edit it and uh, delete. 
also nodes list uh, component uh, have several updates. All columns uh, in node list are uh, sortable now. So by the date, uh, titles and uh, type. And uh, uh, the second column title uh, was uh, revised. Now it's called uh, title and details and contains uh, our full information about the node. Um, <clears throat> here we can uh, have an edit button and uh, when we click on it, it uh, redirect us to the edit uh, node page. And uh, show more button we will have if uh, we have uh, more than uh, uh, 255 characters in the detail section. If we click on it, it will uh, show us uh, full uh, details information. Uh, that's all updates. That's all updates uh, of our side. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please contact us. Thank you, this looks great. I know that people have been waiting for some of these features for a long time, so it's great to see them in. And we have up next Vega with Darcy. Hello, um, so I just wanted to open by saying that um, what we're gonna focus on today for demoing is going to be um, another part of automated patron blocks. We've done some demos in the past that were a little more focused on the configuration and the settings, as well as um, watching what happens when you try to check out a book when there's an automated patron block or a renewal or a, um, yeah, a renewal or a um, checking out. Um, but uh, today we're gonna show a little bit more on the user details page. And then the other thing that we wanted to also demo is that we've also, sorry you guys about the phone, I can't do anything about it. I'm not in my normal space. My internet was down, so I'm in a different space. Um, but the other thing that we've demoed in the past was um, overdue um, automated notices, focusing on the overdue notices. Um, and recently we made some changes to the templating front end, depending on what category you choose, whether it's an automated um, fee fine notice or it's a manual or other type of notice. So that's gonna be our focus. Um, and I also just wanted to mention that I think as many of you have been, and um, you might be aware that we've been also focusing on a lot of bug fixes and hot fixes um, over time. So there's not much to demo there, but also, um, we've been also making good headway on our refactoring fee fine actions, which is um, a big part of this Q3 delivery. But there's not much to show on that front yet. Hopefully next sprint we'll be demoing that. So with that, I'll let Alex go ahead and um, go on with our demo. So hi everyone. Um, as Darcy said, we had done some work in extending and reorganizing tokens available for patron notice templates. Uh, nam namely, we have extended the list of available categories for patron notice templates. As you can see, we now have a separate category for automated fee fines, uh, fee fine actions such as pay, wave, refund, and so on, and also manual fee fine, manual fee fine charge. Selecting one of these categories changes the set of uh, available template tokens. Say, for example, these are the tokens available for automated fee fines and uh, fee fine action section is disabled. If you select fee fine action category, fee fine action is unlocked and you can use those tokens in your templates. Also, we have enabled all of these tokens. Uh, so now you feel free to use them in your templates. These are tokens for, uh, related to items, loans and user. Uh, so let's see them in action. Right here I have uh, two templates prepared, one for, for manual charge and another one for action. The only difference between the two is that uh, if you find action section is available for uh, action template. And both of these uh, templates contain all of the tokens available for uh, their respective category. Uh, so in order to see them in action, I will have to create a 
fee fine. So let's create one. And let's add additional info for patron. It's going to be visible in the in the patron notice. So I press charge, and we should see an incoming email any second. Yeah, as you can see, all of the tokens are in place, even with the nifty barcode images. So next, if I try and pay this charge in cash, let's add a note. I'm gonna press pay, we should see another email this time for fee fine action. Yeah, it's now collecting the data from all over Folio, so let's give it a second. There it is. Yeah, as you can see again, all the tokens are replaced by correct values, and if you find action section is also filled as expected. Now, that's it for template tokens. And another thing I wanted to show you was the work we've done on automated patron blocks. Um, just as a recap, automated patron blocks allow us to limit actions such as borrowing, uh, renewals, and requesting based on configurable uh, limits set up per patron group basis and Limits um, allow us in the user to set a specific limit values for each patron group. Now we have finished the implementation for all six conditions, um, each of which allows tenant to configure which actions should be blocked when a certain limit is reached. And the combination of two, condition and limit, gives us a reasonably fine-grained control of automated action blocks. So let's try and see uh, how it works in action. Say we want to set up uh, blocks for borrowing and renewals uh, for cases when maximum outstanding fee fine balance is exceeded. We should set up a message. And here I have the user from faculty patron group. So let's set up a limit for this group. Say we want to set notes maximum outstanding fee fine balance 10. Let's save it. As you can see right now, uh, this patron doesn't have any blocks. Well, they should change. I'm going to try and create a fine for this user. So we set up the limit uh, for 10, and now I will try and issue um, if you find for 11. So this should create a block for this user. Yeah, as you can see, um, the, a new automated block has been created for the user. It shows the message that we have configured and the actions which we have chosen to uh, to block for this user. Um, also, we can try and create a manual block, say for requests. And as you can see, manual and automated blocks do coexist happily in the same table. And now if I try and remove this fee fine by say ban it with cash. The block should be gone. Yeah, as you can see, we only have a manual block left on the user details page. Yeah, and the other blocks, they work in a similar fashion with um, their own respective nuances, but pretty much uh, everything should be fairly intuitive for the user. And that's probably 
all I wanted to show you today. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. Thank you. And I just wanted to follow up with a quick thanks to Alex. Um, this has been a lot of work. As you can see, there's a lot of bits and pieces to automated patron blocks. So it's been a very complex feature. Um, and I think today's demo just showed a little more holistic um, and comprehensive view of it. In the past, we were only able to show little bits and pieces. It looks great, guys. That looks really good. Okay, so next up is core functional. Um, Bogdan and Sergey are going to show um, some of the new age to lost functionality the team has been working on, plus um, the ability to create inventory records through FastAd and some other um, high priority inventory enhancements. And I should also mention that the team has been doing a lot of work um, for actually quite a while. A significant percentage of our um, development goes towards bug fixing. So since our last demo, we've fixed another 47 bugs. Go team. All right, Bogdan, it's over to you. Yeah. Hello, guys. Let me share my screen. Um, yeah, OK. So today I wanted to show you our new feature that is called age to lost items. The idea of this feature is um, to allow automatically detect um, overdue loans that uh, has overdue more than some interval that to define is in associated lost item uh, fee policies. This, this should happen automatically. And this actually includes changing the status of the loan. Then uh, we may uh, trigger some pattern notification, for example, just notifying them that they should uh, return the book to the library. And also uh, this feature will allow you to automatically assign uh, lost item fees, again, using the associated lost item uh, fee policy and yeah, this these fee fines, lost item fee fines can be um, can be assigned just immediately when we uh, have detected an item that belongs to these rules, or within some after some period of the uh, changing uh, item to age to lost, just give uh, um, just give a user an opportunity to bring the book back to the library. Um, this feature actually implemented as a scheduled API job. This job is triggered uh, every 30 minutes. And so just, I have, I have an item that is already aged to lost. So as you can see, I have used one hour loan policy. This basically means that um, the loan will be overdue um, in one hour after checkout. So at 5.08 a.m. And um, yeah, it should be H2 lost after one minute after overdue. So this is actually configured in lost item policy. Um, let me show where it is. So yeah, here we have items age to lost after review property and it is configured to one minute. Let's go back to the loan. Yeah, so as you can see, it was age to lost and um, the corresponding um, loan action has been created. And also the item itself uh, has age to lost status. Okay, so, and another just small feature related to age to lost items. It is um, about uh, checkout. So, um, we are not allowing checkout for such items. So when, when I now uh, try to check out age uh, to lost item, it should be rejected, yeah. So here, here is a message that's saying that such items cannot be checked it out. Okay, that's actually it about this feature. Any questions?
maybe. Thanks, Bogdan. Thanks. Sergey, are you ready? Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Kate. I'm gonna share my screen. Can we see it? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, at first, I'm gonna show you some improvements in the inventory application. First of them are about the display in two elements. Uh, two elements, loan type and effective location. In the item list of the instant record and uh, like the rest of the elements, these two are uh, also sortable as you can notice. Uh, to demo the next improvement, we have to go to the uh, holding record page, let it be here. And in the holding details, you can notice uh, that it was added, uh, the ability to distinguish holding statement nodes as public and staff. Uh, the existing data element node uh, has been relabeled as public node and uh, it was also it was added a new one marked as stop now. Uh, the next thing I'd like to present is ability to filter instance records by source option. Uh, you can see here in search and filter pane, uh, source option, this works in predictable and understandable way. If we, if we select folio option, uh, we get the records with folio, uh, folio format source. If we select mark option, we get the records with source mark for format. If we select both options, we will get uh, the records with either folio or mark source format. Let's reset it. Next the feature about the ability to search by call number I readable option. It's here in uh, the holdings and in the item segments. Uh, they work the same, and so I'm gonna show you how it works in holding segment. I've already prepared some instant records in which the call number value in the holdings is the same and equal to A, B, C, D. Uh, after selecting call number I readable and click the search button, you can see these records and in the view in holdings, you can see the call number. Uh, the call number field has this value. And in the second uh, record, you can see this value in call number prefix uh, element. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, uh, this call number, uh, un no, no, uh, unlike call number normalized here, uh, this option call number uh, I readable um, works differently. And uh, for example, if I add uh, just space, a space after enter it value, and uh, click the search, uh, we will not get the same result, uh, but the call number normalized uh, handle, handle with. Uh, 
Uh, this is because um, I readable. I'm gonna return to the correct value. Uh, I readable means that the entered value uh, should exactly match the value which filled in either in call number uh, element or in call number prefix or, or in call number uh, suffix element or should match to the correct concatenation of the value of this element. Um, I see it sounds a little complicated. Uh, you can experiment, you can play around with different combinations of uh, these call numbers elements. And if you have uh, any question or some misunderstanding about how it works, you can con contact me via any communication tool, or you can ask Charlotte because she is the best in the understanding of this functionality. And I'm going go going go ahead and let's move to the another feature. And there is uh, a new functionality called fast add template for creating a brief instance record with holdings and item data. In order to have access to this functionality from different parts of the application, this template has been implemented as a plugin. It's not finished yet and it's still under development. Uh, currently we have the access to this plugin from the inventory, inventory application. You can see the item new fast date record in the action drop down menu. I'd like to demo the access to create in a fast date record through checkout page. And you can notice the button new fast date record in the upper right corner. After clicking this button, uh, you can see the new, new fast at record form and you can notice that all elements mimic the design and behavior of the elements in the standard inventory creation form. Let's uh, fill in the required fields. Uh, I do wanna mention that uh, Unlike st uh, the standard item creation form, where suppress for, from discovery option is disabled by default, it is enabled by default in the fast add form. In the next couple of sprints, uh, we will add the ability to specify defaults for fast add for this suppress from discovery and instance status term. Okay, let's uh, fill in uh, the title. This title. Material type. And try to save. Oh, yeah. And uh, also I'd like to say that uh, while checking note option is optional now on the item record, uh, we made it more prominent uh, in, on the fast edit form to encourage folks to, to edit. Let's, let's fill the value here. And after save and close, I forgot to, bar to put barcode, okay. Uh, we see the message inventory, uh, the, these records it is created successfully. And if we go to the inventory and uh, try to find, yes. Uh, here, here you are, this is record is present in the instance record list. And as I mentioned earlier, this feature is still under development and, um, for, and uh, some improvements are coming soon. For example, there is a story for automatically copy the 
barcode of the newly created uh, pasted item to the clipboard and fill in the barcode field in when we try to to check out the item i guess it's uh, that's it from me if you have any question please ask or contact me via any chat email or something else thank you thanks sergey looks good um okay so we've got 15 minutes left and a demo from stripes force and then one for erm so john coburn is up first with stripes force All right, thanks, Kate. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. So uh, today, quickly, I'm going to talk about some visual updates uh, that we've done recently for the date picker component. Um, let me share. Share. Okay. So, the chat. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Right now, I'm looking at the uh, the edit page within UI users just to get there really quick, and it has a handful of date pickers on the screen. Uh, so the control has changed slightly from where it was before, where the calendar automatically would pop open when you focus the component. Now uh, it's it's a it's a controlled uh, click of the calendar component that's going to bring it up. So it'll be a little less uh, intrusive, you know, whenever you're trying to tab through fields, uh, trying to get through with a keyboard. Updates to the component uh, have included an accessibility overhaul. Uh, so so uh, right now, you know, we're looking at uh, an experience for screen readers that, that, that's truly ideal and, uh, and, and bringing even better uh, keyboard control um, to the component, you know, as a result. So uh, the most obvious updates that we'll see you know, here, both for uh, users of assisted technology and for uh, for mouse users, sighted users, uh, is we've added uh, controls uh, for for the month and the year uh, at the top of the component. So you can see now you have a drop down where you can quickly move uh, the date you know, a number of months without having to click and arrow, 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 you know, through <laughs> uh, 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 multiple options. Although if you still prefer to do that, you can. Um, so uh, grabbing, grabbing a day, clicking a day, you know, sends you right back to the field. Uh, we still retain features like being able to just clear the date out, uh, going in, grabbing a new one, you know, of course, um, changing, changing our year. Uh, you know, for example, all that good stuff still there, uh, uh, you know, similar internationalization capabilities, although things have changed a bit uh, uh, in that implementation as well. Uh, so previously, we were dependent on our, our date library, uh, Moment.js, we were dependent on a static set of locale uh, setups from that. And, and now, um, We've expanded that capabilities in this in this version of Date Picker uh, by actually using browser uh, built-in internationalization API uh, to derive a, a localized date format. So this expands the range of what we had previously with those static formats. You'd basically or locales rather. You'd have to roll your own locale for whichever locale you wanted to support if one was not exists and, and if one did not exist. And you know we were seeing issues with that come up where it would go back and default to English, right? But you know that's 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 certainly not ideal. Um, so so that's a place where we've we've shored things up developer experience of this component has improved as well because uh, we used to have to give the component a, a, a sort of manual reset by applying like a key property developers on the call will know what i'm saying because they've run into this issue uh, with the old date picker but now it works just as expected as you'd expect any react control component 
to work. You give it a value, you use it to set, uh, you set a change handler, it sends you out a value with the change handler, that cycles back around to the component. So that circle is complete. Uh, and this means we'll be able to start using this date picker in places where we haven't been before, like date range filters, et cetera, you know, uh, uh, that in the past maybe have had to use text filters, text fields rather, um, due to due to this date picker component not working correctly. Uh, so that's just a quick presentation, quick run through of this stuff. I know we're a little short on time. So um, so uh, uh, we're, we're, our ears are open for feedback about this. My ears definitely are open for bug fixes that you guys, bugs you might run into with this, uh, as well as any more feedback for continuing to improve this component and any of the Stripes components. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John. All right. And it's over to you, Owen, with the uh, ERM demo. If you're still on. Ah, good. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, you can see um, Folio up there now. Yeah. Okay, so in ERM, we've been working on a new um, UI app, uh, which is ERM Comparisons. This uh, is, it's only the UI that's new here. The back end is um, still mod agreements. So um, this is, uh, I think the third UI app that uses mod agreements in the back end. Um, so when we're looking at um, resources it, that are purchased electronically, we can have, um, one of the things about it is that you often buy a group of resources and what's actually in that group or package as we call it can change over time. So the comparisons app allows users to compare the content of um, groups of e-resources either because they want to compare them say to know uh, how these overlap or, or don't overlap in terms of the content. So that might inform purchase decisions or to see how something has changed over time so they can see what's been added, what's been removed over a period of time. So to show uh, this, here I have uh, an example of an, a, a package of e-resources and the access start date tells us the date on which a title was added to this package. So um, this one was added in 2014 and the second line here was added in 2020. So if I now go to a comparison, I can uh, do a new comparison uh, which um, compares that package um, to itself on a different date. So if I select to compare that package on say today, uh, today's date, and I compare it to that package, um, to uh, using the new date picker, um, why not? Um, let's compare that to a year ago. Um, then when I save, uh, let me get back to you. Okay, there you go. Right, so if I save that, what that does is it runs that comparison, um, it, offline so um, and when that report is finished I get back to this screen where I can view the comparison report that button doesn't become active until the comparison report is run. What I'm generating here is a JSON document which compares at this point in time that does that comparison so once I've done, run a comparison report that's a report that's static uh, I, it doesn't update as we go on I'd have to rerun a comparison if I wanted to compare the same thing in the future. And if I view that comparison report, then I can see uh, a, an output. Um, so behind this is a JSON document, but it's being rendered into the screen. Um, I can see that this title um, and uh, how it's available to me and if it has a coverage. So for journals, um, this is especially relevant that I have access to a particular period of publication for this. And I can see that's in both packages, uh, sorry, this, the package on both dates. If I look at the second line, I can see that the history of David to Copperfield 
um, is in the package if I look at it as the package was on the uh, today, but was not in the package if I look at it a year ago. So I can see stuff as being added to this package. Um, and we have uh, different kind of comparisons that you can run. So the same package with different dates, or um, you can have situations where you're comparing a, a package that you can buy from a vendor with a particular kind of uh, agreement or group of resources that a uh, an institution has purchased. And here we can see an example where um, in the agreement, which is what the institution has actually purchased, um, and in the package, we have the same title. So we have the title, but in the agreement, we purchased this coverage, which goes from everything published from 2003 to 2009, whereas the package that was offered was everything from 2002 to 2009. So we can see that what we purchased is not the same as what was uh, is currently being offered by the um, publisher. And over on the right hand side, we actually we have a uh, an indicator which tells us or tells the user whether this is a full overlap, so exactly the same thing in both packages or both the agreement and package in this case, or whether it's partial, or of course none would be the op would be the other thing where. Um, so partial in this case means the same title is available, but not for exactly the same coverage. So we can see easily there's kind of some overlap. It's the same title, but it's not full. Um, and there's kind of quite a, the, um, the, the development team um, have worked really hard on this. There's been quite a, a lot of complication, both in terms of the back end doing the comparisons to start with, um, but also um, in the display here, this has been quite complex because we've got multiple nested MCLs here. So um, uh, we have here um, kind of the, this spans two rows in the, um, in the MCL. And so we have nested MCLs and we can have, I think three layers of that. Um, and also we've had uh, to work with um, the, the Stripes team to get things like uh, styling for individual cells in the MCL um, and um, and getting headers, um, these headers uh, dynamically generated um, so that we can, uh, and styled so we can center headings, et cetera, as we need to. So it's been a lot of work from not just our team, but uh, other teams as well. Uh, and um, final thing, uh, where it's a very large comparison report, um, uh, it can actually take quite a while for the, the display to generate. It's not the downloading of the, the data from the back end that happens usually quite quickly, even for a large report, but actually generating that into the MCL for display. And what um, Aditya particularly worked on this uh, to have a situation where we can render the first hundred items from that. We can't paginate it because it's a single JSON document we're getting back from the back end. Um, but what, but we've done some pagination in the front end to just render a hundred rows and then offer the option to load the rest of the report if the user wants to, or they could just export that, which is a lot quicker because they just get, get the JSON uh, directly. Uh, if they want to export the JSON, they can do that as you'd expect from the actions menu. So that is a very quick run through. Apologies for keeping that very quick, but uh, I know we're short on time uh, of the comparisons application. Thank you, Owen. That looks like a great new feature. And um, thank you also, Owen and everybody else for keeping your demos um, efficient and quick so we could get it all done. I'm sort of amazed um, that we got through it all just in time. So thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Um, of course, we'll be sharing the, um, the recording up on um, YouTube as usual. So thanks all. I wish you a wonderful rest of your day or night.